Hello everyone, welcome to today's live broadcast, Turnkey Resources, the Genetics Toolkit. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational virtual meeting presented by LabRoots. For more information, please visit labroots.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This session is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational virtual meeting and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the session is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Jean F. Jenkins, PhD and RN, Clinical Advisor for the Division of Policy, Communications and Education at the National Human Genome Research Institute, which is NHGRI, the NIH. Dr. Bob Wilden, MD, Chief of the Genomic Healthcare Branch at the NI at NHGRI, helped create the Genetics Toolkit, but is not able to join us today. Dr. Jenkins previously worked at the NIH Clinical Center Nursing Department, the National Cancer Institute, and the Genomic Healthcare Branch of NHGRI. Dr. Jenkins has been motivated and committed to preparing others to become aware of, plan for and integrate genetic concepts into clinical practice. Dr. Wilden, as an ABMG certified clinical geneticist, has practiced general clinical genetics in academic and non-academic settings, including in rural healthcare systems. He served as medical faculty at three academic centers performing grant-funded research on rare genetic disorders, caring for patients, and teaching. Dr. Jenkins and Wilden's complete bios are found on the LabRoots website. I will now turn it over to Dr. Jenkins for her presentation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the last session of today. I'm hearing a lot of echoes, so hopefully I just fix that. The last session of today is called Turnkey Resources, the Genetics Toolkit. So Don, can you let me know if you can hear me okay now? Excellent. So let's go to the first question of my presentation that I'd like to have you contribute your answers to. Why did you decide to attend today's session to learn more about genetics in the clinic? And Don will send out the information to you to be able to respond. Is it because it's the current craze to make a difference in offering personalized health care? because your patients are asking you questions that you can't answer, because you like a challenge, or to be able to be positioned to lead the way. I'm just curious about the audience, so if you can respond to one of these, we'll see what the makeup of the group is. So it looks like we have a lot of leaders in the group because many of you said that you'd like to be able to be positioned to lead the way. And this is fantastic because I think a lot of the resources that we'll discuss this afternoon um, can get you started on that pathway if you're not already familiar with some of these resources. 
The other valuable side effect of learning all this information is that we can make a tremendous difference in offering personalized health care. So it's very exciting to see that that's also um, one of the benefits that you think you'll achieve with today's session. So let's go to the next slide and I'll just explain to you um, if I can get out of the pool. There we go. That indeed, I agree with you that the discoveries of genomic variation associated with health, disease, and treatment options when translated into practice can make a tremendous difference for a patient and his or her family. And along with that comes the benefit of personalized care. We have this specific information that may benefit that individual and perhaps his or her family. And I'm sure many of you have been getting questions asked by patients because they are interested in the potential for benefit, but they may have also heard about potentially safer options, such as in choosing the best drug or the best dose um, for a, a treatment intervention. So why you? I'm so excited to see that primary care providers are taking such a great interest in this topic um, because physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants are often the first contact of individuals entering the healthcare system. You may also have ongoing relationships with them and their families, and so you're positioned to make a huge difference to that individual as well as many other individuals in their family. So I really do believe, and slightly biased, that this toolkit is for you. So I want to review a little bit about the toolkit. First off, as you may recognize, it is only a beginning. This is more of a lifelong learning journey because so much information changes on a daily basis. So you may need to focus in on where this information can make the most difference for your patients. You may have other team members that can help you build the tools and the infrastructure required in your setting to be able to integrate this into practice. And the very first step is knowing what you don't know because there are multiple entry points to finding resources. And in the next 30 minutes or so, I hope to provide you with some of the beginning steps of options to explore. So let me begin with this statement and ask you, in terms of our understanding of genetic and genomics and integrated it into practice, are we all the same? Well, if you look at the literature and the research that has been done on this topic, pretty much we're all the same. Um, healthcare providers, regardless of our discipline or role, have reported similar knowledge deficits because most of us do not have genetic and genomic information in our academic preparation. But we do have access to resources and those who know more. So it's a really very much a beginning step for beginning that lifelong journey to learn more. So let me ask you this question. Which healthcare discipline currently has recommendations for genetic and genomic competencies. Think about your own role that you play. Do you know if your discipline, whether you're a genetic counselor, that's kind of a no-brainer, um, a nurse or advanced practice nurse, a physician or a physician assistant, do you know if you currently have recommendations for competency or all the above? I'll give you a few seconds to think about that and to reply, and we'll see what the knowledge level is of knowing about your competencies. So the poll's now been closed, and we'll see what the results are. So obviously, Many of you know that the genetic counselors have their specialty competencies for their scope of practice. A few of you know that nurses and advanced practice nurses and physicians and physicians assistants may have competencies. And almost half of you know, which is the correct answer, that all the above actually do have competencies that can be referred to to look at what the focus of learning may need to be. So let's go to the next step and I'll tell you a little bit more about what the competencies are. I just have to find my correct slide. Okay, as many of you noted, primary care providers do have recommended competencies. And additionally, one other discipline that's not on the list, pharmacists have also identified genetic and genomic competencies for their healthcare provider uh, education. 
And you can find all of these listed on a resource um, in the toolkit called G2C2 at this specialty link. And as you may recognize, these competencies can really help develop educational resources and academic education curriculum, but they can also be of value to your thinking about your own personal learning and how to um, address perhaps your own genomic literacy gaps. So several of the disciplines have actually published their competencies. Um, I have the most recent article from the physicians in genetics and medicine that have published their physician competencies that you heard from Dr. Bruce Korf earlier. And he was um, very instrumental in getting that group from ISCC, which I'll tell you more about in a little bit, um, to be able to identify those competencies. On the right side, the physician assistants, just to let you know, they've just recently updated their competencies or are in the process of publishing them. And the bottom level is the nurses and graduate degrees. So these are advanced practice nurses and graduate degree nurses um, that have also identified their competencies. So are they different or are they the same? Well, we all deal with patients across the life continuum in very different settings. Um, but all advanced practice um, at nurses, physicians, and physician assistants have some common competencies that have been identified across the healthcare team. And this isn't all of them, obviously, but it is kind of a sampling of what you might want to consider as you begin targeting where to begin your own learning. You've probably heard a lot about some of these issues today, basic genetic and genomic concepts, family history, genetic and genomic testing, treatment, referrals, and ethical, legal, social issues. So I'll try to share with you some resources for each of those as we continue the conversation. So I don't know how many of you have actually looked at all the materials that are available from this Genetics in Your Clinic webinar, but if you look at the directory, there is a link to the toolkit. And this great thing about now that you're interested in this topic is that there are a tremendous number of resources that are available for you and your patients that have been created and are now available. Sometimes the difficulty is actually whittling down what is the most important one to focus on right now and when to come back to that other resource or be able to identify things that your patients might be able to benefit from. And so this is a starting point. And Dr. Wilden and I looked at a number of resources and um, identified these that we hope will be of value to you um, in your journey of learning. You can also note that from the webinar site, you can download the PDF of the toolkit. Um, so let me begin showing you how the toolkit is organized and how you be, be able to learn a little bit more. First off, the toolkit is um, laid out so that there is a subject at the top, and we've identified some categories that I'll share with you in a moment, um, that if you're interested in, say, test interpretation or patient advocacy, you can look at the color-coded version of the category and identify the few resources that have been added for that specific topic. Next to it is the resource itself, the title, the link, and these are direct links, so if you're in the PDF form on your computer, you can actually click on those and go to them. And then on the right side is a small descriptor um, of the resource itself. So the categories, um, you don't have to remember these, but you'll maybe just want to kind of highlight in your mind if there are certain learning areas that you want to make sure you focus on. There's some on variant interpretation, some on public health, genetic testing, educational resources of value to healthcare providers, educational webinars, disease-specific information, problem-solving for patients, patient advocacy. There are some discipline-specific specific organizations so that you can learn more from others um, that have that specialty knowledge base, and genetic and genomic disease as well as genetic and genomic education for the public. So let me provide you with an example of how some of these resources might be of value to you. So Joan is being seen by you in your office. She brings up in conversation that she's been looking into her family's ancestry is considering sending saliva in for genetic testing. She is excited because the company offering the testing also provides information about health risks. And she asks your opinion about the value of knowing such information for her care. 
Patients are paying attention to the ads on TVs and in magazines, and perhaps someone has actually asked you about how to direct um, their thoughts about consumer testing. And there are several resources identified in this toolkit that provide basic genetic and genomic information that may be useful in answering their questions. So for example, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has a wonderful website that talks about information on genomic discoveries with population health benefits. And as you can see from this slide, if you go to the CDC site, there are materials about hot topics of the day. And also on the right hand side, there's information about an impact weekly scan. You can actually look at that scan um, and determine if the information is of interest to you and click on those for more information about that specific topic. On the CDC site weekly update, this might be very interested in, uh, for those of you wanting to keep up to date on what the most recent literature or lay language materials are coming out. And so this weekly health impact has a lot of information about um, hot topics and also about um, things like Alzheimer's disease, big data, deep vein thrombosis, just to name a few. So you can click on that specific information or you can request this genomic and health impact update um, to keep you up to date on what is coming out in the lay materials and also in the literature. Another source of information for primary care providers is available from the organization, the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education in Genetics, or ISCC. This group brings together medical and clinical educators from many professional societies and related organizations, and they represent many of our disciplines that are on this call today, including physicians, genetic counselors, nurse practitioners, uh, pharmacists, um, physician assistants, you can name a number of, of many different disciplines and they're represented here. And they also have many work groups that are working on topics of concern to their members. And so there are annual meetings and you can attend those often in Bethesda, Maryland. So if you go to the ISCC website, you can learn more about the members and the work groups and see if this might be a, a group that you could uh, join and learn from or help your healthcare discipline to also be involved. The ISCC work group has created a webinar, so this is located on the webinar section of the toolkit, but I want to highlight it because I know many of you are concerned about reimbursement issues, and so the ISCC work group created this resource to fill a gap in the knowledge for insurance companies, and so you can see more about that webinar at ISCC as well. So obviously these resources are not only in the United States, there are many international resources of great value to each of you, including the educational resource created for the UK National Health Service providers. And this site offers uh, online course materials, workshops, and a wide array of educational resources um, provided to healthcare service workers in the UK to utilize genetic and genomic tools in practice. So this site may also be of great interest to those of you who are thinking about learning more about integrating genomics into your practice. One of the challenges being able to find materials of value to healthcare faculty at the beginning of looking for resources that were out there for teaching about genetics and genomic information that may have implications for practice was uh, the development of a foundational site for faculty members that provided links not only to resources but also then tried to identify what those resources might be able to teach to in, in terms of competency concerns and recommendations. So G2C2 or the Genetic Genomics Competency Center um, has the availability of peer-reviewed resources for use in your classroom or practice including websites, books, articles, and more. So I encourage you to browse or search this site, and this is also the site where the link for the competency documents is housed as well. Now you can search this site um, many different ways actually, but one of the ways is by uh, looking for your specific discipline. So for example, if you wanted to search by physician, you would type in that um, under the 
the site identification for which discipline you're looking for, and it will pull up a listing of resources that are identified by that uh, category of healthcare provider, and then you would be able to see, oh, I can link on this, 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 and this. And one of those examples is a site that is also included in the toolkit that came from G2C2 listing of physician resources called Genetics Education Canada Knowledge Organization, or GECGO. This Canadian site um, has resource tools for primary care providers that include educational resources, modules, and evidence-based summaries. And it also provides listing of public resources and genetic centers in the Canadian area. So this might be of great interest to those um, in Canada. One of the other things that was identified is that as genetic and genomic information begun, begins to be implemented in practice, that it is sometimes hard to teach those in academic settings because you don't want to do the wrong thing or you don't want to have, um, perhaps you don't have enough access to cases that are um, adequately preparing the student for what is coming for the future. And so this site called Global Genetics Genomics Community, or G3C, was created um, to help provide that interaction that perhaps may occur with your patients in a safe environment and be able to learn more about the questions and concerns of patients who are perhaps beginning to um, utilize this information in their decision making. So this G3C um, web, web place has 15 interdisciplinary cases um, as you can see on the left side, you, you will need to register because um, CME and CE is coming available soon, um, but we don't keep that specific information online or anywhere that it is held against you, but it would be possible for you to access the CEU materials at a later point in time. But these interdisciplinary cases have case content or notes here. And then you can click on one and have options for learning. It also has um, the capability of unfolding case scenarios so that you interview patients at your own pace. And there are supplemental activities that can help you learn more, such as going out to look for a screening recommendation or for testing information. It also allows you to assess your genomic competency because it allows you um, to make recommendations and see if you made the correct recommendation based on resources. And consider an expert commentary on several of the cases have been um, added as well. So there is some Spanish translation of these cases in process and probably within the next month or so, a couple of those cases will have that content. So one of the cases that has been identified as an interdisciplinary case, and I know you heard about cystic fibrosis earlier today, is Lisa. And she is concerned um, about her potential risk because her brother has cystic fibrosis um, because she's just learned, out that she learned that she's pregnant, and so she is concerned about that issue for her family and her family decision making. So one of the other major categories that I'm sure you, you um, have needs as well is finding out about genetic testing. Where is genetic testing occurring? What kind of genetic tests are available? Um, what are the laboratories? And so there have been um, a couple of those identified resources where you can find out more about genetic testing. And these include two sites here that are listed, uh, the genetic test registry or GTR and gene test. Both of these provide you information about genetic tests and where to find labs performing them. Um, you can filter options and links to related information sources including on the GTR information from some of the, the companies who are offering the testing. And the test and lab information on GTR is voluntarily provided by the labs themselves. This site also may include the test purpose, methodology, validity, evidence of the test usefulness, and laboratory contacts and credentials. On gene tests, you can also filter information and links to related information sources and search for gene disorder, type of test, and laboratory location. And there's also additional links to clinical genetics resources for practitioners so you can learn more about information that might be of value to you. Two important
important curated resources, and I think you also heard about this earlier today as well, that are available to learn about the genes and the evidence and clinical applicability and test interpretation are ClinGen and ClinVar. ClinGen um, helps you find resources for specific disorders. You can enter the gene, the condition, or the medication to search the ClinGen linked resources. It also includes a button to go to ClinVar where a specific variant search um, is a possibility. And you can identify where clinical laboratories assert the clinical significance of the individual variants that they have assessed. ClinGen actually rates the variations by evidence level, and there are webinar tutorials that can walk you through how to best utilize this site for your knowledge and learning and interpretation. One additional item that's available to your patients on this site is a portal called Genome Connect. And this is a, a beginning resource for patients to be able to indicate their gene and phenotype um, for registry efforts for future research importance. So let me move on to another case, pharmacogenomic testing. Kong is complaining of diabetic neuropathy, and you're considering ordering carbamazine, but recognize his Chinese ethnicity may increase his risk for toxicity, which it may be seen as a severe and deadly or life-threatening skin rash. You look at this toolkit to see if there are any resources to learn more about recommendations for pharmacogenomic testing and find the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium, or CPIC site, by PharmGKB. On CPIC, there is some wealth of information that is available about certain drugs and those that have gene tests um, that are available to be able to identify whether or not they may benefit the patient by having a different drug or benefit the pa patient by having a different dose depending on uh, their gene variation identified. So there's guideline information and recommendations um, on peer-reviewed dosage and gen gene testing guidelines for pharmacogenomics drug gene pairs that is very, very helpful as you begin to think about whether or not a test is available, and if so, how you might go about getting that testing done. So this is the next poll question for you. I realize you may not have seen all the resources in the toolkit, but one of the ones you've just heard about if you have utilized one of these toolkit resources and recommend it to others, if you could respond. The Genetic Testing Re Registry, or GTR. The Genetic and Genomic Competency Center, or G2C2. ClinGen and or Clin ClinVar. Global Genetic Genomics Community, or G3C. Or finally, the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium Guidelines, or CPIC. Please respond if you have used those and would recommend them to others. Poll has been closed. So it looks like the majority of you have already utilized ClinGen and our ClinVar, which is very exciting to see as it is a, a new resource that is being created for clinical applications. And so I think um, if you haven't visited for recently, you may be surprised at its new look and feel. Um, so I encourage you to go to ClinGen and ClinVar. Um, it looks like many of you have used GTR as well. Several of you have begun to hear about CPIC guidelines and fewer of you of G2C2 or G3C. So if you, from what I said, or from the descriptors on the toolkit, think they might be of interest to you, I encourage you to go and look at those resources. So next, I had mentioned that there were some educational webinars, and these were a few that we selected um, that uh, might be of value to the primary care provider. And I'm going to highlight um, one of the webinars are a valuable way for healthcare providers to think about genomics and medicine um, and to uh, identify perhaps topics of interest to you um, to guide the selection of which ones you look at. 
The Genetics and Primary Care Institute, a collaborative project of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Maternal and Child Health Bureau of Health Resources and Services Administration, created a number of resources that may be of interest to the primary care provider. Um, only one of these is the six-part webinar series, video and slide sets. There's a lot of things that you could view on this site. Um, the webinars have focused on providing primary care providers with knowledge and resources to better provide genetic medicine as part of a medical home. And there are hour-long educational webinars. They build on existing primary care provider skills, and they provide a comprehensive approach to considering how primary care integration of genetic thinking can occur with every patient encounter. And one of them I'd like to highlight is this example on the right of integrating genetics into your practice. Um, what every primary care provider needs to know is a webinar that might be of value in follow-up um, to what you've been already hearing today. As I mentioned earlier on, these topics of the toolkit are organized by subject. So for instance, in, instance excuse me, um, if you're interested in disease-specific information, uh, say you're an oncologist and you're, you're reviewing a case um, that you want to know if there's any specific guidelines related to cancer genetics, there's a wonderful resource and, um, that may be applicable in learning more about your answer to what Shirley is asking you. Shirley received targeted treatment of her metastatic breast cancer. She has completed treatment and is now being seen by you for a sinus infection. She mentions that at her support group, one of the participants mentioned she has the same kind of cancer but had gotten another drug, and she's asking you if you can explain why. So one of the resources that might help you with this disease-specific information uh, question is a site from the National Cancer Institute called PDQ. And PDQ provides information summaries on genetics that are of great interest, I think, to those of you providing care to patients um, who have a history or are diagnosed recently with cancer. And for example, this is one of the um, cancer summaries. They provide an executive summary, and then on the right side, there's a list of all kinds of specific details about what the evidence shows in terms of diagnosis, treatment recommendations, and they also do have information um, of information for families that might know about special referrals or care. So for example, on PDQ, there's an overview about cancer genetics. There's information about cancer risk assessment and counseling. There's genetics of breast and gynecological cancers, as illustrated on the screen. Genetics of colorectal cancer, genetics of endocrine and neuroendocrine neoplasians, genetics of kidney, genetics of prostate cancer, and genetics of skin cancer. So you can see that this information might be of value to you, but also to the public um, or patient that you are seeing. So obviously there are also a lot of patient-specific questions that come up about rare or genetic diseases or diseases that don't have a diagnosis yet that a patient may be coming to you and having numerous symptoms. So these sites are of value internationally because they provide content in several languages. Um, the Genetics and Rare Disease site, or GARD, is very um, valuable in identifying several ways that you can look for a disease specialist or for someone who has expertise in caring for a person with a rare disorder or has experience with that particular condition. The GARD site also provides information about how to find genetics clinics and research on a particular condition. And the GARD site has a really uh, nice way of being able to type in or email in or call in questions, and they will turn around responses to the healthcare provider or the patient who is asking that specific information. When a diagnosis has not yet been made, um, knowing about the NIH-funded network of qualified clinical centers and technical and laboratory support centers across the U.S. where you can refer patients may be helpful to you. Um, the Undiagnosed Disease Network, or UDN, accepts applications from patients or providers to diagnose both rare and new diseases considered undiagnosed through intensive clinical and genomic research. This may be a potential solution for those confusing patients that you want to be able to contribute to their care, but also to contribute to discovery 
about genetic and genomic contributions to health and disease simultaneously. So this is another example of a competency that is recommended across the healthcare providers, a referral. So as you review Kevin's family history, you note an extensive frequency of cancers occurring at young ages. This is indicative of hereditary syndrome in his family, and so you want to refer Kevin to a genetic specialist for education and counseling about genetic testing. You receive the positive test results that Kevin receives um, after going through genetic counseling and testing and recognize that he needs a referral for a colonoscopy, although only 30 years old. NSGC um, is one of the professional member organizations that's listed in the toolkit um, that offers information about medical genetic specialty providers. Uh, you can find policy and practice guidelines too about the genetic counselors and their educational resources. But one of the resources that is of great value to you would be the identification of clinical genetic services and counselors, perhaps locally in your environment. One of the final common competencies that healthcare providers and patients express concerns about the most is knowing more about the ethical, legal, social implications associated with genetic testing. So in this case, Stacy's sister Peggy is enrolled in a whole genome sequencing study designed to determine why she experienced cardiovascular problems at a young age. And she asks you for guidance about participating as her sister has requested. She is concerned about use of this information against her in the workplace, but you know about Gina, so you can discuss privacy concerns. An example of the concern about genetic information being used against you um, is identified with, on this site where they provide an overview of the Federal Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act and its protections in health insurance and employment. This site includes answers to common questions about what we commonly prefer to as GINA and examples to help you learn more. It was created by a coalition of policy, education, and advocacy groups, and although slightly older, um, 2010 was when this site was created, the information is well presented and probably still very accurate and applicable to your learning needs. So patient tools are also really important um, because they often have questions about integrating genomic information decision making into their care as well. And a valuable resource for patients is the Genetic Alliance, a network of more than 1,200 disease-specific advocacy organizations plus universities and private companies, government agencies, and public policy organizations. This is a very active group where they offer shared resources and creative tools and innovative programs um, at the intersection of health and genetics. And the Genetic Alliance has also been active in policy and general advocacy circles. And so those with genetic and rare diseases, as well as the more common diseases, are finding the Genetic Alliance site very useful for learning. And so may it be of value to both you and your patients. One of the resources the Genetic Alliance staff has created is called Baby's First Step. And this resource um, is a information that prepares patients for the newborn screening process. And it offers genetic information and family resources about newborn screening at this local, state, and national levels. And it also serves as a clearinghouse for newborn screening information. So if you're getting questions from your um, patients about you know, why did my daughter-in-law and um, my grandson have to go through genetic testing differently in one state versus another state, or is that indeed true, or is that a myth? And so this newborn screening site can tell you more about what the recommended genetic screening is currently for newborns. There are additional patient tools. Um, many of these are available in more than one language, and so may be of value to you um, if you speak differently than English. So for example, Spanish and others um, are available on Orphanet. This is a site that provides information on rare disease and orphan drugs, and it's designed for all audiences with links to additional resources. So this is an official site of the European Union, and they have many different languages. Um, so I encourage you to look at that site to learn more. One other tool that is available in English, Spanish, and other languages is the Family History Tool, 
um, that is available from the Surgeon General Family History and the Genomic Healthcare Branch. This site is available in English, Spanish, as I mentioned, and it's available for family history collection. Um, a web-based tool that helps you, you organize family history and then print it out for presentation to their healthcare provider, but it also can be shared with other family members. So it's a consumer-friendly tool that will possibly help them learn more about sharing family information with other members and others um, in their care provider decisions. I'm sure many of you, um, your family members as well as those patients or their family members have come to you and say, I just don't understand what this genomic information is all about or do I need to understand it? And so the, there's been a public education effort through the Smithsonian Museum exhibit um, that was in downtown DC for several years, one year, excuse me, um, that is now coming across as a traveling exhibit to many states. And so I encourage you to go to this companion website um, to the popular Smithsonian NHGRI science exhibit um, and explore online. It has a virtual visit so you can see what's included in the DNA exhibit. Um, there are resources for teachers and students, so those kind of things may be helpful to the general public that you in encounter that have questions. There are topics on genomic medicine, cancer genomics, and much more. And so if you go to this site, you may see if that traveling exhibit is coming to you um, in the near future. So if you go to the next question, this is the last question for my section. So if you had to identify, in addition to my own education, there are other steps to integrating genetics into the clinic. I think the most important one I can provide my leadership skills to is evidence development, guideline development, clinical infrastructure, tools such as the EHR, or consideration of reimbursement for services. As you identified in the very first question, many of you have attended today's workshop because you were interested in being a leader and being able to make a difference for patient care. That is so exciting because education is only the first step in that and that all these other components are equally, if not more important in being able to make a difference to what we can offer to patients and their families. So I'm interested to see how many of you have interest in leadership in one or more of these areas. So the poll has now closed. It's very exciting to see many of you interested in evidence development and guideline development because that seems to be a huge gap in helping move the translation of genomic information into clinical care. Obviously, we want to make the decisions that are best for our patients, and being able to have that evidence to develop the guidelines is really quite important. Also, the clinical infrastructure may be slightly different from what we're used to, um, or we may not even know that some of our genetic specialists are available to us in our clinical environment, and even just setting up a referral process may be part of that infrastructure that could be started right away. But definitely the clinical infrastructure building on the education and knowledge of your workforce and yourself will be very, very important for the future implications and integration of this into practice. Tools such as the EHR are going to be quite valuable in documenting what is learned in those genetic tests and, and contributing to the decision making uh, about what to do with that information, who to share it with, how private can it be, how important is it to share. All those policies are yet to be refined. And so those, in addition to the reimbursement for services, um, a little smaller number of you perhaps thinking you could uh, have, you know, have it, um, have uh, the ability to make a change there, but that's still very much a leadership role and very much needed for what needs to happen for the future. So thanks to all of you for thinking about those leadership roles as you've gone through the day. So let me go to my summary slide and then we'll um, close off with questions and answers um, for discussion. So obviously, I've only provided a sampling of what the toolkit has to offer you. Um, the possibilities of genomic healthcare are simultaneously exciting and a bit disconcerting at the same time for many people. And so as you begin to think about what you need to learn and how to begin that process and where to start, download the toolkit PDF from the ASHG site and explore some of these resources that might 
be identified as most helpful to you. As we've talked today, you may be thinking about what leadership role that you can have to make sure this information is integrated into care appropriately, safely, and effectively. Um, as we identify, there are lots of opportunities, um, including interprofessional education, thinking about cost coverage, evidence development, guideline creation, clinical infrastructure, and tools. And each of you have begun the step in making that difference by learning as much as you can today and being able to help others find these resources and be able to reach out um, to make a difference for your patients today and for the future. Thank you. Thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. So here's a question from one of our attendees. Are there reviews available of outcome studies using current commercially available genetic panels? So I know that um, in discussing the ClinVar and ClinGen resource yesterday um, with Dr. Ramos and um, Annie, they had discussed the fact that they are encouraging those who have, are using expert panels to be able to submit um, evidence of how valuable these panels may be to uh, identifying what tests are, um, are of value to patients. So I don't know that that is up and running just yet. Um, Dr. Bob Wilden was also possibly going to join the question answer, and so I may defer to him if he's available. Um, but I, I would encourage you to look at ClinVar and ClinGen and see if that might be a possibility to explore further there. I would like to once again thank Dr. Jenkins for her presentation. Do you have any final comments for us today? Now I'm just excited that so many of you are interested in this topic and um, I will be available in the lounge for 30 minutes following this session if you want to ask more specific information about the resource tools or anything else I can assist you with. But um, go forth. I know you're probably very tired after a lot of uh, great materials today and I encourage you to um, begin this lifelong journey or continue this lifelong journey if you've already been involved with genetic and genomic information for a while and begin to help others uh, think about how they can come along with you in this exciting time for patient care. Thank you. I have another question for you if you have a moment. Um, which resources do we look do we use to look up frequency of a variant, conservation, et cetera? And what information do we need to input about the variant in order to access information? That's very specific information. I know that the Genetic Testing Registry and Gene Test um, have links to many other resources from their site. If that specific detail is not identified directly underneath of what the laboratories or others have submitted, um, I would encourage you, you know, things like OMIM or other test sites that have very specific information um, have that available as well. And I know that many of the laboratories themselves are beginning to synthesize a lot of that materials in the test report when it's sent back. And I will also ask if there are others who have um, guidance into that that you'd like to share. If you'd be part of the lounge a little bit later and type that into the, uh, the chat room, we can uh, include that in the summary of the, the session today. Another question for you. Um, is there any website specifically for ongoing trials for genetic conditions? That's a really good question. I know that clinicaltrials.gov summarizes um, many of the clinical studies that are available across uh, the U.S. for um, various disease-specific uh, issues. 
So, for instance, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov and type in Lynch cancer syndrome, it will um, pop up with a number of filters that you can apply and perhaps find out if there are clinical trials and you can filter by location or by um, the drug or by different things. Um, so I know that there are some genetics uh, clinical trials listed there. Um, I know there are some clinical studies available through the clinical center at the NIH. And there is access off of the clinical center website to be able to find out what clinical trials are available. And uh, again, if there are others of you who know of resources, um, please type that in and let us know. Thanks again. This is an educational virtual meeting and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the session is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Today's virtual meeting will be available for on-demand viewing through September 22nd, 2016. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this session will be available for replay, and we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. You are also invited to join Dr. Jenkins in the networking lounge shortly after her talk concludes where she will be answering questions for 30 minutes. Just go to the meeting lobby and enter the networking lounge. In the lounge, there's a live chat feature where you can type in your questions. If you asked a question in this session, it will not transfer to the lounge, so you will have to re-enter your query. See you next time. Goodbye.